Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you to our very first Remember America lecture series. And uh, very excited about this. I, I think that you are in for a real treat uh, with what we're going to be doing uh, throughout this month. Uh, we're going to take a very focused look at America's Christian history. We don't, aren't going to be able to do the entire timeline, but we have selected, we believe, three very, very important links on the timeline that we use that will help illuminate God's hand in America's history. So tonight we are beginning, as you see, with the principal approach, America's historic biblical Christian method of education. Now you may be wondering, well, if this is about history, why are we talking about education? Well, those of you that have gone through school know that you gotta take history when you're in school. Uh, but I have come to appreciate and love history over the years. That really didn't grow in me, though, until I started to understand God's view of history and education and how those two intersect. So we're going to look at that this evening kind of as the foundation that we'll use to launch the remaining three sessions. But let's begin with a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight and we're asking for your blessing on this lecture series. We thank you that you have revealed truth to us in your written word and in your Son. And Lord, I pray that uh, this evening we would be able to lay the groundwork for understanding your view of history and what that means to us. And I pray, Lord, that uh, it won't be my words that are spoken, but they would be undergirded by your word and that uh, we would leave this place with a greater understanding of who you are and what our responsibilities are as American Christians. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I again want to go to this first slide and notice that I'm saying that uh, biblical Christianity and the reason that I do that, rather than just saying uh, a Christian approach, is because we want to look past Christianity just being one of the three great world religions. We're talking about Christianity as God has unfolded in his word. And sometimes there's a big difference in that. And so you will find very quickly when I begin to talk about the principal approach and about America's Christian history and about day spring and what we do here, that God's word really is central to everything that we do. And we do the very best that we can to our ability to make sure that we are aligned properly with his words and not just allowing other ideas to filter in to uh, what we are teaching the students. So let's begin now by talking about the principal approach. The principal approach is a model of education. It's the kind of education that took place here in America for about the first 200 years from the coming of the pilgrims and then shortly thereafter uh, with the Puritans. This was a form of education that produced great things. It was uh, from the heart, it occurred in the homes because many of our uh, ancestors during that colonial period were homeschooled. Uh, it also took place in our churches and then eventually in our schools. When schools began to form, this was the methodology that was uncovered by some researchers as they were looking through America's Christian history. Interestingly enough, this form of education is what produced the men and women who could reason from biblical truth or biblical principles to found the world's first constitutional federal republic that was based on Christian principles, based on the Bible that had never happened before, and the liberty that unfolded because of that, well, you know the story and how that has impacted the world so greatly. So we want to look at that model and try to understand, well, if it was based on God's word, God's word is just as powerful today as it was 235 years ago, 500 years ago, 2,000 years ago. 
And if we return to those principles of truth and we live our lives according to his precepts, his principles, we will see a renovation of our age, even as occurred during our founding period. So that's some, one of the basic premises that we uh, approach this study of history with. See, the principle approach lays Jesus Christ as the foundation for all of learning. And we love to do this. We always uh, base our points and, and the concepts that we're teaching on the Word of God. And so we go to Scripture and we try to find out, well, does Scripture teach this? And there are many, many Scriptures that teach this, but I just picked three out here for this evening to kind of whet our appetite a little bit. For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. From Romans 11.36. And then in Colossians, the Apostle Paul is writing, Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And again in Colossians, in him all things hold together. See, those are grounding verses that even help the teacher in the classroom formulate lessons. It's that practical. See, God's word does speak to every aspect of our lives, and God spoke principles or laws into existence at creation that govern the subjects. Because the subjects weren't created by man, they were created by God. They're tools that we can use to know him, understand him better, and to then impact our world and extend the kingdom of Christ. But also, we like to look historically. And so here I pulled uh, this quote, and is actually taken out of New England's First Fruits, uh, which was uh, a, a tract that was written about Harvard College when it was first uh, formed back in uh, 1636. This was part of their preface. Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well. The main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, John 17, 3, and therefore to lay Christ at the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. Yes, you did hear me correctly. Harvard College, now of course Harvard University, one and the same but vastly different from those founding years, what they started out, their vision, their intent to where they are today. So what happened in those intervening years? How could that have occurred? And I think we'll get some insight into that tonight as we continue on in our study. Well, the principal approach to education emanates from a biblical worldview. Now that term worldview is bantied around quite a bit and there's a reason for that because every one of us in this room, everyone listening to this, all of your friends and associates and family have a certain worldview from which they approach life. It gives them basic understanding how they answer the big questions about life. Who am I? Why was I made? What are my duties? Who is God? Is there a God? What happens to us after death? These big questions are answered by how we put together a worldview. The worldview that we espouse here at Day Spring Christian Academy is a biblical Christian worldview. So it's already been laid out for us by God himself. He didn't leave us out here on our own to try to figure out what is it that we're supposed to do. He tells us in the Bible. So since the principal approach comes out of a biblical worldview, interestingly enough, as we use the principal approach, as we employ it in our classes, our students then begin to develop a biblical worldview that is based on biblical Christianity. The presuppositional context of a biblical worldview is biblical Christianity. And presuppositions, as you see there, are the ideas received as true 
even though they may not be able to be proved. In other words, we have to take a leap of faith. All of us do. Sometimes we think, well, yeah, Christians have to take, have faith to believe in God and believe that God sent his son and that his son died for our sins and rose again. Absolutely. But you know, every worldview has to depend on faith at some point. So where are we going to put our faith? That is the question. Well, ultimately, a biblical worldview and a principal approach uh, education are based on absolute truth revealed in the Bible. So right off the bat, I would probably be shouted or laughed out of the room if I were speaking in one of our liberal colleges today because uh, no one believes that there's such a thing as absolute truth. In fact, it's absolutely true that there's no such thing as absolute truth, right? Well, let's take a look at some of these presuppositions, these things that we accept as foundational and we stand upon them. First of all, that God is creator of all things and sovereign over them. We're talking about the sovereignty of God Almighty. The physical universe exists for the purposes of God and for his glory. In other words, it's not about us, it's about him. That's a presupposition of biblical Christianity and the principal approach. The second one, and there are many, I'm only pulling three out this evening, that the Bible is God's word written by men, inspired by by the Holy Spirit, and it is infallible, it is reliable, it is eternal, and it's applicable to all areas of life. So right off the bat, we uh, kind of put a, a death knell to the idea that there is a sacred in a secular world. There are some things that, yes, that you can believe that in your heart. You can even practice that in your church or in your home. But then there's the rest of the world, the real world, that God doesn't have any place in that. No, God is ruler over all. And there is no dichotomy there. Then the third thing is to talk about history. History is such a very, very important backbone of everything that we do uh, here at Dayspring, uh, and not just the history course, because we know that every subject has a history. Every subject, as I said, was uh, put into being by God himself, so we can look in scripture, and we can actually see evidence of when he revealed certain things about the different subjects, mathematics, and history, and language, and literature, science, all these things, we can see them emerge in Scripture as God is instructing us. One of my favorite verses that really, I think, helps bring this into focus, because we talk about Christ, or history being Christ, his story. Doesn't that sound beautiful? It's Christ, his story. It's not human history, just a string of events tied together and trying to see, well, who's going to overcome who, who won what battle, and now guess who's in power and so forth. But it's this magnificent display of Christ and the plan that God has for the ages. This verse is taken out of Ephesians, the first chapter, and, and I always like to read it out of the J.B. Phillips translation. It says, For God has allowed us to know the secret of his plan. And it is this, he purposes in his sovereign will that all human history will be consummated in Christ, that everything that exists in heaven or earth shall find its perfection and fulfillment in him. So if we go back to that previous slide and we look at that little timeline there, we can see right in the center of that timeline I have a cross because Jesus Christ is the focal point of all history. We see the arrows on that timeline going outward, one to eternity past, the other to eternity future. Because Christ, as God, stands outside of time. He existed before time, and he will exist after time. 
But what we look at, what we focus on are between the two perpendicular lines there where you see time and human history. So at creation, time began. And we're involved in time and space now on planet Earth. And that's where this beautiful story of God's love for his creation takes place. And we're going to talk about that shortly in the providential view of history. Now, I want to just take a moment here to talk about a very important man in our history as a nation. He's one of our founding fathers, but most people don't recognize him so much in that. They think of him as a person who wrote a dictionary, which he did. But he had a tremendous impact on our nation. And of course, I'm talking about Noah Webster. Noah Webster is one of my all-time heroes. I love to read about him. His life story is just amazing. One thing that really, really surprised me when I first started studying him is that although he was a professing Christian for the first 50 years of his life, he really did not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And he came to understand that and know that because a revival came through his town up in Massachusetts and the Lord began to press upon him and convict him in his heart. And finally he gave in and realized, I need a savior. And at 50 years old, he became a born again Christian. And then the interesting thing about that is it was just shortly after that, that he began his major life work of the American Dictionary of the English language. It took him 26 years, or I'm sorry, 21 years to write that dictionary. And we are so blessed that we have it because that dictionary represents the biblical worldview that existed in that colonial and founding period of our nation. So we have exhibit A in that dictionary that this isn't just made up stuff that we talk about when we say that there was this prevailing biblical worldview in our nation at that time. Webster in his dictionary often refers to scripture to help elucidate and illuminate the words that he's talking about. But let's look at this particular definition. It's his third definition in uh, of uh, providence. He says, in theology, providence is the care and superintendence which God exercises over his creatures. He, he that acknowledges a creation but denies a providence involves himself in a palpable contradiction for the same power which caused a thing to exist is necessary to continue its existence. You don't find many definitions like that, do you, nowadays? He didn't stop there, though. He went on. He often preaches a little sermon at the end of his definitions, and he says, well, some persons admit a general providence, but they deny a particular providence, not considering that a general providence consists of particulars. A belief in divine providence is a sort of source of great consolation to good men. By divine providence is often understood as God himself. So what Webster is doing here, many things, and, and we're going to take a look at that in a moment, but I want you to realize that when Webster is defining his terms, he's defining them the way that our founders, the ones who wrote the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, all of these uh, writers were using that same understanding of language. So when we hear our founders talking about providence with a capital P, they're talking about God. So that's important for us to understand that, that they weren't just being politically correct. They weren't saying nice things so that the peons out there uh, would accept them. They believe these things with all their heart. So what does this definition provide for us? Well, first of all, it provides this biblical definition and the application of the word providence. It helps us to know how to use the word providence. It also establishes God as creator. Right off the bat, it talks about God and his creation, his creatures. It reveals elements of God's character. We see just in this definition that God loves his creation. 
that he's compassionate, that he takes care of it. This definition is actually governmentally based, and Webster did this a lot in his definition and his writings because he understood that what was happening here in America was new to the world. Very few people really understood what this idea of self-governance was all about. And so he began to instruct and teach people a biblical understanding of government. And he says that God has this superintendence over his creation, which is a governance term. And then in this definition, he also refutes deism. Because deism holds the position that, well, yes, there very well may be a God, obviously. But he, after creation, withdrew himself and is just kind of allowing things to wind down like a clock and doesn't intervene anymore. But that's not what Webster says. Webster says that's a palpable contradiction, that God is involved in the care and superintendence of his creation. And the founders believed that. The biblical foundation for this understanding of providence, because it is a biblical idea, providential history, I just have a few verses here for us to look at, but there are many, many, many from the beginning of Genesis all the way to the end of Revelation. By me, kings reign and rulers decree justice. Another one, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none like me. I am God and there is none else, declaring the end from the beginning and the ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Yea, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass, for I have purposed it, and I also will do it. God is in charge of planet Earth and the whole universe, and his purposes will be fulfilled. And finally, another one out of the New Testament where the Apostle Paul is speaking to the uh, people in Athens. He says, the God who made the world and all the things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served with human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if, they, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and exist. What a beautiful picture of divine providence. That should give us great solace as we are involved in a, in a very challenging world in our time. But I also want us to look historically, just give some evidence of that view of providential history that was prevalent during our founding era. First of all, Samuel Adams, who we call the father of the American Revolution, said, and brethren and fellow countrymen, if it was ever granted to mortals to trace the designs of providence, there's that capital P, and interpret its manifestations in favor of their cause, we may, with humility of soul, cry out, not unto us, not unto us, but to thy name be the praise. George Washington, of course, first president of the United States said, it would be particularly improper to admit in this first official act my fervent supplications to that almighty being who rules over the universe, who presides in the council of nations, and whose providential aids can supply every human defect, that his benediction may consecrate to the liberties and happiness of the people of the United States. And then... Benjamin Franklin and his autobiography made a whole list of things that he believed about God and his impact in our lives. And he said, there is one God who made all things, that he governs the world by his providence, that he ought to be worshipped by adoration, prayer, and thanksgiving. I know a lot of people 
uh, try to put Benjamin Franklin in the uh, lot with deists. And yet as Franklin aged, we see a real shift in his thinking. And I hope that one day I'm going to meet Benjamin Franklin in heaven. We don't have evidence of that, but just some of the things that he wrote in his later years, to me, uh, show that he really began to open his heart and his understanding to God's plan of salvation through Jesus Christ. And then finally, John Adams, another great statesman, second president of the United States, said, And may the being who is supreme over all, the patron of order, the fountain of justice, the protector in all the ages of the world of virtuous liberty, continue his blessing upon this nation and its government and give it all possible success and duration consistent with the ends of his providence. So this idea of a providential view of history is very, very important. And sadly, in most American schools today, there's not even the hint of that. In fact, God, as most of us know, has been summarily dismissed from our classrooms, and yet we see evidence that that has not been very productive for our nation. So I want to come back now and look at, well, what is the education connection in all this? We've talked about history. We looked at the colonial period, the founding period. So what about education? What can we do about it that connects us with education? I have a chart up here uh, in the PowerPoint that has four uh, segments in it. And notice that there is a black line up at the top that starts over on the left with the view of God and continues all the way over to the right to the view of government because each one of those are connected. Remember I talked about Webster and his intent and, and bringing uh, a, a governmental understanding to the populace. We call that thinking governmentally. And that's something that I think is very important and very valuable for us and for our students to learn to think from cause to effect, to understand with logic what comes out of another thing. And so we look at our view of God will affect our view of man. Does that make sense to you? If you believe in the God of the Bible, then you're going to have a certain understanding and aspect of man. If you don't, if you believe in some other God, that's going to affect how you view the human race. How you view humans then affects how you view education because you're going to educate children in a certain fashion that is based on your view of God and your view of man. And then finally we come to this last one, which is the view of government. Most people never stop to think how our view of government, the kind of government that exists in our world today, here in America, is the product of generations of education. And so we have that red arrow there that says there is a cause and an effect, always. The view of God causes a view of man. The view of man causes the effect in education, and the view of education causes an effect in government. Interestingly enough, there's a quote that is attributed to Abraham Lincoln that says, the philosophy of education in the classroom in one generation becomes the philosophy of government in the next generation. So the shift that we have seen taking place in our nation in the past 20 years or so, actually the past 50 years, those things are the result of how we were educating the rising generation. I don't know about you, but that gets my attention and that pierces my heart because I don't think we've done a very good job and passing truth on to our children that would allow us to get to the place in the early 1960s that prayer and Bible reading were removed from the schools because they were afraid that the Bible would do psychological damage to children. How would you have judges that would reason to that? Where did that come from? It didn't happen in a vacuum, unfortunately. Seeds had been planted in the generations before that gave 
uh, that bore fruit and those justices that could come to that conclusion. And then about 10 years after that, when the Supreme Court found a right in the Constitution to abortion, again, how, how could we reason justly to that conclusion? Well, we can't, really. But education has a, a role to play in that. I've expanded the chart up here for us to take a look at these four areas in America today. Because if we look at the view of God in America today, the prevalent view of, of God today is that we are in a pluralistic or a relativistic society, that anything goes. There's no absolute truth source. There certainly is no absolute God. Uh, you worship God the way you see fit, or you maybe don't even believe in God, and that's okay, because in a sense, we've made man God. He determines, he creates his own God because he is God. Well, how does that affect our view of the human race? Well, our view has become very evolutionary. Of course, beginning back in 1859, when Darwin published his book, uh, things rapidly went downhill. But that, again, that didn't happen in a vacuum. It wasn't all of a sudden, this book came in and everybody's like, oh my goodness. No. The soil had been tilled, seeds had been planted, and they were germinating in the heart, and we saw it first in the church. We saw things begin to unravel in the church, and people began to uh, bring academia to bear into the church and have higher criticism and doubt the veracity of God's word, and that spilled over then into society. But we have the survival of the fittest. Look out for yourself because nobody else will. The devaluation of human life. These are all effects of the secular view of God. Well, how does that then affect the view of education? Our educational system today is very behavioristic, Pavlovian, conditioned response. Why? Well, because we see human beings as just a higher order of animals further along on that evolutionary trail. And therefore, we want our children just to regurgitate what we tell them. Our education has been, become very standardized where there's a certain uh, dialogue that takes place because there are certain tenets that we want to go out into our society, and it's centralized, where there is an elite who try to control the educational process. We see how that has happened, and parents <coughs> continually get pushed out further and further away from the educational process, and yet scripture is very clear that it is parents who stand responsible before God for the education of their children. And then how does that affect the view of government? Well, our government today is very expansive. It's intrusive. It rules by judicial fiat, even though we have a representative republic. It's socialistic. It, there's a loss of individuality and political correctness rules. So these are the fruits of all those things that go all the way back to our view of God. So what are the conclusions from this chart? First of all, nothing happens in a vacuum. Our worldview is de developed first in our view of God. Everything that we believe can go back to what do we believe to be true about God. There is a direct relationship between education, character, and government. Character determines government. And how is character formed? Char character is formed through the education process, first in the home, certainly. That's the, that's the primary educational venue for children. But then as those children are placed in schools, the school, the teacher, all of the activities of the school begin to help mold and shape and form the character then that will lead to how that child views government when they are in leadership. Our methods and our curriculum help develop the character. Therefore, we are responsible for the character that develops in the hearts of our students. So what is God's view on education? I believe that there is an education mandate in Scripture. God talks very clearly and consistently throughout the Old and New Testaments about the importance of education. 
He doesn't say, thou shalt send your child to this school or that school. He speaks to us in principles. He gives us latitude to make wise decisions that fit our context, but he's very clear on the purposes of education. The pur purpose of education is teach our posterity the words and works of God. In Psalm 78, it's a wonderful psalm. I really challenge you to go to Psalm 78 and uh, dig into it and study and reflect on it because it tells us that he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded to our fathers that they should teach them to their children that the generation to come might know, even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell to their children that they should put their confidence in God. Once they know God's words and his works, that builds confidence in them that that same God can help me in my life, in my world, and I want to serve him in my generation. The methodology that is very clear in Scripture, we see it, first of all, in Deuteronomy 6, where it talks about that when you rise up, when you lie down, when you go out, when you come in, you put God's Word on the, the doorposts and lintels of your house. Everything is saturated with God's Word. I call it the like an intensive, uh, you know, we would have these language uh, systems, and they say, well, immersion into the language is the best way to learn it. And I believe that's what God was laying out in Deuteronomy to the Israelites. Immersing in God's word. Let that be the context of all learning. And then the consequences, well, it goes one of two ways. If we follow God's ways, then we secure a blessed future for our posterity. As it says in Deuteronomy 7, 9, it says about the Lord blesses to the thousandth generation those who obey his commands, follow his words. See, it's not that he just waves a magic wand and we're blessed. He expects us to do our part in following his word. But then we see the other side that when we don't do that, disaster happens, and especially there in Psalm 78 again. If you go there, uh, you'll see that it talks about the, the sons of Ephraim and the day of battle they turned and fled because they had forgotten the works of God. They no longer had confidence that they had the tools to be able to defeat the enemy. And we don't want that to be the case for our children. We want to equip them and prepare them for the world in which they will live. Now back to Noah Webster. Let's look at his definition for education because this is, if I may use the term, delicious. Because I want you to really savor this, and you're going to see why in just a moment. Webster says, education comprehends all that series of instruction and discipline, which is intended to do, and he has four things, intended to enlighten the understanding, correct the temper, and form the manner and habits of youth, and fit them for usefulness in their future stations. And... Here's his little moral lesson. To give children a good education in manners, arts, and science is important. To give them a religious education is indispensable. And an immense responsibility rests on parents and guardians who neglect these duties. That's his biblical view of what education is all about. And you know where he got that to a large extent? Well, if we look at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, where the elderly Apostle Paul is instructing young Timothy, he's talking about Scripture and the power of Scripture in our lives. And he says that all Scripture is inspired by God and it is profitable for, and he lists four things. Profitable for teaching, for reproof or correction, for training in righteousness, and for making the man of God adequate, equipped for every good work. And you can see right across that chart the parallel to Webster's definition of education and enlightening the understanding, correcting the temper, forming the manners and habits of youth, how they can, should conduct themselves, and then making them useful in 
for us, we're talking about useful in the kingdom of God so that generations to come are blessed. And that is the heart of the principal approach. Teaching and learning by principles, and we call it the principal approach because we draw on the principles in God's word. We actually teach children how to identify those biblical principles and then begin to apply reason, logic to those principles to see how they affect the world in which they live. It works beautifully in the classroom with school subjects because they're nice and uh, compact and we can deal with them. But our goal is not to have it just book learning. We want them to see that they go beyond that to life, to where we live. So principles are seeds that contain all the rudimentary uh, information needed in a given subject that lays that foundation for a sound analysis, for true understanding and mastery. We're not talking about surface learning at all, where most education takes place. Just learn the facts, learn the vocabulary, be able to you know, regurgitate it, and we'll give you a seal of approval, send you to the next grade, and eventually you get a degree and you can get a good job. That's what it's all about. No, we talk about beginning internally and working it outwardly. Biblical principles do not provide content in a given subject, but they function as governing forces that guide the learner along a pathway of reasoning that yields godly wisdom. I'd rather have godly wisdom any day than to be able to uh, recite, uh, you know, Homer's uh, Iliad or something like that. Those are wonderful, rich things, but their purpose is beyond just what human reasoning affords. And we talk about something called the 4R method of biblical reasoning, which produces this excellence of character and thinking that we've been talking about. These four R's are part of what we call the notebook methodology that existed in this model that I've been talking about in the colonial and founding periods. The four R's are research, reason, relate, and record. And we apply those in various ways and fashions. We actually have a pedagogy that we go through with our students to help them learn how to do that. And uh, if we had time tonight, I would hand out a paper and I would give you an opportunity to put it into practice yourself. If any of you are true scholars, which I'm sure you all are, you will email me and say, oh, please give me that assignment. I would love to do a 4R of a certain word. Well, I'm going to give you the tools to be able to do that, and then we'll just see. Someday you may be up here teaching others how to do that. But let's look at some of these key tenets of principal approach education. These are just some of them. These are the ones, though, that I wanted to highlight this evening. Obviously, we talk about biblical reasoning. We want our students to be able to reason from God's Word to every area of life, and we want that to be done based on sound hermeneutics. We're not asking students to just pick a verse and beat somebody over the head with it or say, you know, misapply God's word, thinking that that makes them spiritual. No, we want to make sure that we're rightly dividing the word of God. Thinking governmentally, there's that term again. Learning to think from cause to effect. Who or what is in control in this situation? Having them go back, step back and reflect upon the situation and apply logic. Christian character development. Often here at Dayspring, we talk about character development being primary to everything else that we do. In fact, it's more important than the subjects that we're teaching because out of the heart come all the issues of life. And so school does give a great opportunity to develop character. If you look up Webster's definition of character, you see that its root is in scraping or marking something. And often character development is kind of like that, isn't it? It's not fun. Character development is hard, but it's how God shapes us into the image of his son. Providential view of history, we've already talked about that, Christ's story, classical studies, looking at that which is tried and true, noble through time, and 
filling our minds with those things, as it says in Philippians 4. And the notebook method with our four R's that I'm going to show you in just a moment. And we also have a great emphasis on influential expression. Say, we don't want to just be sitting there in the classroom or in the pew and filling ourselves up with all these wonderful things, but there needs to be an outlet. We want to be able to be influencers in our world. And so we have a strong emphasis on how to write and speak with perspicuity, how to be cogent and credible and inspiring so that people want to hear more and become learners themselves in that area. So here again are those four R's that we talked about, and uh, research, reason, relate, and record, and how each one of those help fashion our thinking and then make that application to our own lives. And that's a critical thing for students to understand, why am I learning this? Have you ever said that? Why do I have to know calculus? I'm never going to use calculus. Well, we come to understand that these are gifts of God, and maybe I'm not going to be a mathematician or a rocket scientist, but that doesn't mean that I can't understand the principles that are at work in those subjects, because that rounds me out. That, that helps me see how great our God is. So this 4-R process, this is the thing that, that when I teach a class on this, I actually do give an assignment at this point, but it's very simple. It's very basic. There's, I would say there's nothing sacred about it. It's not thus saith the Lord, this is how you have to do it. But this is just a handy tool that we use with our students. And when used diligently and seriously, it produces a superior understanding of any subject or any word from a biblical Christian worldview. The more you dig in, the more you begin to understand God's perspective on whatever term that may be. So you might want to pick a subject that I'd like to understand what God's view of mathematics is. So that's where you would start. You might want to look at a character trait. Like, I would like to understand the word respect. What does God have to say about respect? Because my teenager is pretty disrespectful right now, and we want to do a study together to see what God has to say about that. So it's a handy tool, and I list some things there that, come in, that you really need if you're going to do that. Of course, number one is you need your Bible, and you need a concordance, and you need Webster's 1828 Dictionary. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I, there are actually eight steps to this process where you begin defining the word using Webster's D Dictionary because of its biblical foundations. And then you go into Scripture and you begin to look, where is this Scripture used in Scripture, or where is this word used in Scripture and in the context that I'm trying to understand? So we're not asking you to proof text, and that's what kids do at the beginning. Oh, here's, that word is in this verse. I'm going to just write this down. I want to get this assignment done but we help them grow in their character and know that that's not acceptable. And we send them back and we begin to understand that, oh, here's an aspect of that word that I didn't realize. And this comes from creator God, the one that actually invented this term. This is how he views it. So is language important? How we define words, is that important? Have any of our words been redefined recently. Tragic, isn't it? That's why I say if you're going to study our history, if you're going to study the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence, then we need to understand what they meant by those words when they wrote them. That's why we look at Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Do we use modern dictionaries? Well, of course we do. We live in the 21st century. But if we're trying to study Biblically or historically, we pull his dictionary out because it's a primary source. And that's something else that we do very much as part of principal approach education, is go back to original documents, primary sources, so we understand what the person meant, not what some modern publisher may be trying to sell to us. And then uh, we see the other uh, four steps that really you can see here at the end, you end up with this paragraph where the student is relating that term or how does this subject impact me 
from God's point of view. So we're slowly but surely transformed by the renewing of our minds. See how important that is? So applying the principal approach to America's Christian history, just a fabulous quote here by Reverend Fulgham. It was actually on the centennial celebration of, of uh, the Declaration of Independence, and he preached a sermon which was so common back in those days. There were election sermons. There were artillery sermons. The pastors were deeply involved in what was going on in the world, encouraging their parishioners to understand life from a biblical perspective and do something about it. He said, the more thoroughly a nation deals with its history, the more decidedly will it recognize and own an overruling providence therein, and the more religious a nation it will become while the more superficially it deals with its history, just looking at secondary causes, human agencies, the more irreligious will it be. So I think we can just pause for a second here and think where we are in America today. Are we a more religious nation, a more godly nation today than we were 100 years ago? probably scarcely anybody that would believe that. Some people would applaud that, but I know we in this room are grieved by that. And much of it has to do with how we educate the rising generations. Rosalie Slater, who was an educator, uh, teamed up with a government worker back in the 1940s and 50s to research America's Christian history because they were alarmed at what was happening in our nation in the swing towards socialism that was occurring back then. And as they began to dig into America's history and the founding documents, it became abundantly clear to them that God's hand was all over those documents, those journals, those letters that were written and they, they were just amazed. And so they codified a lot of that. In fact, I brought two of the books in here tonight. These are some of the resources we use. The Christian History of the Constitution of the United States of America. This is primary sources here. So this isn't some publisher. There are very few words of Verna Hall in here. There are a lot of primary source documents. And then Rosalie Slater took those documents. She saw the education connection. And so she wrote this book, Teaching and Learning America's Christian History, The Principal Approach. So these and many other resources are available to us today to help us revitalize and resurrect this model of education. It wasn't called the principal approach back in the colonial times. That's, that's a modern name that we coin it with, but it's the methodology, it's the philosophy that was there. So she identified seven principles that governed the, the founding of our nation. As she went through the documents, she saw these principles that gave rise to our republic. And I, uh, just condense the, the names down a little bit. But you see, God's principle of individuality, that's where they began. They understood that there was a God, and it was the God. He was the God of the Bible. That's what they based everything they did on that understanding. And they talked about the principle of Christian self-government. That's a biblical concept. That's not something that came out of the Enlightenment. That was in God's Word. God put that into being. He put that capacity in our hearts to be able to govern ourselves, but we saw how quickly that failed. But he didn't let us stay in that destitute state. But he brought Christ to redeem us and provided his Holy Spirit so that now self-government is a fruit of the Spirit. We don't have to do it on our own. We allow God to do it through us. The principle of Christian character. We've already talked about the importance of character. Character was huge in the founding of our nation. The principle of personal or private property. In fact, the founders viewed property not just as the material possessions, but that our very thoughts, our beliefs are our property. 
and they were violated by the King of England. And that was one of the major reasons of why they wanted to sever the ties because he was unlawfully usurping the property of their ideas and beliefs. And uh, the Christian form of our civil government, we see the pattern in scripture. And we look at how local self-government was planted because you had all the 13 colonies and these people were not educated in uh, governmental structures and so forth. So we had to plant seeds that helped them learn and grow and committees of correspondence that spread across the colonies and brought about union with unity, which was the uh, seventh principle. You can't have unity, or I'm sorry, you can't have a union that will last without unity. We see a great example of that in the Soviet Union, Union of Socialistic Soviet Republic, didn't last because there was no unity. Our nation came very close to being severed, but in God's providence, that didn't happen. Well, there was a time in America when the Bible was revered as the source of truth for spiritual and temporal life, that character training was primary to academic training, that children were taught personal responsibility and accountability before God. They were taught to read using the Bible and biblical principles. They were taught to reason logically to valid conclusions. And they were required to record their learning so they had a record. It was their property that they would value. There's something called the Peers Test that Nehemiah Institute, just about the time that Dayspring was being founded, Dan Smithwick was coming up with this test to try to identify worldview acquisition in children. And so this chart shows what has happened really from 1988 up until the present. And you can see actually four groups of people there. These are Christian students, the black line Christian students who are in public school, Christian students who are in traditional Christian schools, you can see a green line that comes in partway towards the end where he started testing homeschooling students. And then the blue line at the top are students who are in what he called biblical worldview schools that are really comprised of two kinds of schools. And there's a lot I can go into, but we don't have the time. But principal approach schools and uh, American classical Christian schools are in that grouping. But you can see what he did. He measured over time where they landed on his scale of having a biblical worldview. And you can see the downward trend for both Christian students in public school and students in traditional Christian schools. We're going further and further away from God's truth. We're becoming more secular and socialistic in our thinking. And yet you can see at the top, we have a subset that are biblical worldview thinkers. That's principal approach education. So what can we do? What must we do? Well, we have to begin thinking from cause to effect and realize that what we do now will affect not only our own family, but our grandchildren and our children's grandchildren. And so we want to take that responsibility seriously, and we want to raise up our children to know the works of God pass truth on, bring the blessings of God, and help restore our nation to that biblical foundation that is so clearly there, but has been just chipped away at, chipped away at. So that is the principal approach. What you're going to hear in the next three nights, you're going to zoom in to certain of these key tenets and principles and characters, and you're going to learn some wonderful things and be inspired and blessed. I guarantee it. Thank you. Can we close in prayer? Father, thank you so much for your word that is true, and thank you for America. Lord, it's not because we're a great people that we had some corner on education or the, that the, the enlightenment somehow sparked something in us. It's your word that gave birth to this nation. And Lord, our hearts grieve for how far we've uh, drifted from your truth. Help us, Lord. Help each one of us in here to do our part, Lord, to stay true and to preserve, protect, and proclaim your truth in our generation. We ask this in Jesus' name.
Amen.